Alrighty, hi everyone. Um, so we are on chapter 14. This one's called Trolling for Grandpa. It's a bit of a pun there. Um, in the last chapter, the kids found an unexpected message, which is the title of the chapter. Um, and it happened to be from their grandma, who was actually the hen that they were looking after. So they went to Muriel, the witch in the shack, and had her change um, their grandma back, which in return um, set Muriel free. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the grandma was like, we're going to go to Nero, which is a cliff troll, because he has a seeing stone, so maybe we can figure out where Grandpa is. So we're going to read this chapter first, and then we have some questions at the end. No activity this time, we're just going to read and do the chapter. So, chapter 14, Trolling for Grandpa. Have you ever heard, pe of, ooh, have you ever heard people conversing while you're falling asleep, Grandma said? The words reach you from a distance, and you can barely glimpse the meaning. That happened to me in a motel once when we were on a trip, Kendra said. Mom and Dad were talking and I fell asleep and their conversation turned into a dream. Then to some degree you can grasp my state of mind as a chicken. You say it is June? My last clear memories are from February, when, you spell, when the spell was enacted. For the first couple of days I remained fairly alert. Over time I lapsed into a twilight consciousness, incapable of rational thought, unable to interpret my surroundings as a, hu as a human would. Weird, said Seth. I recognized you kids when you arrived, but it was really through a clouded lens. My mind did not reawaken until you let those creatures in through the window. The shock jolted me out of my stupor. It was a struggle to cling to my elevated consciousness. I cannot describe the concentration it required to write that message to you. My mind wanted to slip away, to relax. I wanted to eat the delicious kernels, not arrange them into bizarre patterns. They traveled along a wide dirt road. Rather than head back toward the house, they had continued on the trail beyond the ivy shack venturing deeper into the forest. The trail had eventually forked and then intersected the road when uh, they were currently following. The sun blazed overhead and the air was heavy and humid and the forest remained nat unnaturally silent all around them. Kendra and Seth had brought a pair of jeans, but they turned out to be from Grandma's skinnier days and were not even close to fitting. The tennis shoes belonged to Grandpa and were several sizes too big, so Grandma now wore a bathing suit under her robe and her feet remained in slippers. Grandma raised her hands, staring as she opened and closed them. Strange to have proper fingers again, she murmured. How did you become a chicken in the first place? Seth asked. Pride made me careless, Grandma said, a sobering reminder that none of us are immune to the dangers here, even when we imagine we have the upper hand. Let's save the details for another time. Why didn't Grandpa change you back? Kendra asked. Grandma's eyebrows shot up. Probably because I kept laying eggs for breakfast. I like to think that if he had taken me to Muriel in the first place, I could have prevented all this nonsense from happening. But I suppose he was searching for an alternate route to cure my condition. Besides asking Muriel, Seth said. Exactly. Then why did he have cure Muriel cure me? Well, I'm sure he knew your parents would return so soon, leaving insufficient time to discover another remedy. You have no idea, Seth. Uh, you had no idea Seth had become a mutant walrus and then been restored by Muriel, Kendra said. <clears throat> I missed all that, Grandma said. As a hen, most details escaped me. When I urged you to take me to Muriel, I assumed that she still had two knots remaining. Only when I looked up and observed the single knot did I begin to fathom the actual predicament. By then it was too late. Incidentally, how did you, two end, up, how did you end up as a walrus? Kendra and Seth related the particulars about turning the fairy into an imp and the subsequent retribution. Grandma listened, asking a few clarifying questions. As the path curved around a th tall thicket, a covered bridge came into view up ahead. Spanning a ravine, the bridge was composed of dark wood. Although aged and weathered, it appeared to be reasonably good repair. <clears throat> Our destination draws near, Grandma said. Beyond the bridge, Kendra asked. Down in the ravine. Grandma stopped, studying the foliage off to either side of the road. I am suspicious of the stillness of these woods. A great tension rests upon Fablehaven today. She resumed walking. Because of Grandpa? Seth asked. Yes, and your newfound en enmity with the fairies, but I worry that there may be something more. I'm anxious to speak with Nero. Will you help us, Kendra asked. He would rather harm us. Trolls can be violent and unpredictable. It would n I would not solicit information from him if our situation were less dire. What's the plan, Seth asked. Our only chance is clever bargaining. Cliff trolls are cunning and ruthless, but their aviars can be we a weakness. Avar Ugh. Aviars, Seth asked. It's greed. Cliff trolls are miserly. Ugh. Cliff trolls are miserly creatures, treasure hoarders, cunning negotiators. They relish the thrill of besting an opponent. 
Whatever agreement we reach, Nero will have to feel like he has un he is the undisputed victor. I only hope we can determine something he values that we are willing to part with. What if we can't, Kendra said. We must. If we fail to reach an agreement, Nero will not leave us unscathed. They arrived at the brink of the ravine. Kendra placed a hand against the bridge and leaned forward to look down. It was surprisingly deep. Tenacious vegetation clung to the steep walls. A narrow stream trickled along the bottom. How do we get down there? Carefully, Grandma said. Taking a seat at the edge of the precipice, rolling over onto her stomach, she started backing down the slope, feet first, looking ridiculous in her robe and slippers. The incline was not completely vertical, but most of the descent was quite steep. If we fall, we'll tumble all the way to the bottom, Kendra observed. That's a sensible reason not to fall, Grandma agreed, moving carefully downward. Come along. It looks worse than it is. Just find strong handholds and take it one step at a time. Seth followed Grandma, and then Kendra started down, desperately hugging the side of the ravine, taking tentative steps, hunting blindly for the next place to rest her foot. But Grandma was right. When she got going, the climb was less difficult than it appeared. There were many handholds, including scrawny bushes with well-anchored stems. After proceeding gingerly at first, she grew in confidence and increased the speed of her descent. When Kendra reached the bottom, Seth was squatting near a cluster of blossoms at the edge of the stream. Grandma Sorensen stood nearby. Took you long enough, Seth said. I was being careful. I've never seen somebody move an inch per hour before. No time for bickering, Grandma said. Kendra did just fine, Seth. We need to hurry along. I like the smell of these flowers, Seth said. Come away from those, Grandma insisted. Why? They smell great. Take a whiff. Those flowers are perilous, and we're in a hurry. Grandma waved for him to follow and started walking, picking her way carefully along the rocky floor of the ravine. Why are they dangerous? Seth asked, catching up with her. Those are a, pe a peculiar class of lotus blossoms. The smell is intoxicating, the taste divine. A tiny nibble of a single petal carries you away into a lethargic trance populated by vivid hallucinations. Like drugs? More addictive than most drugs, sampling a lotus blossom awakens a craving that will never be silenced. Many have wasted their lives pursuing and consuming the petals of those bewitching flowers. I wasn't going to eat one. No? Sit and smell them for a few minutes and you'll end up with a petal in your mouth before you even know what you're doing. They proceeded in silence for a few hundred yards. The walls of the ravine were more clear, sheer now, rocky as they progressed. Uh, they noticed a few other clusters of lotus blossoms. Where's Nero? Kendra asked. Grandma scanned the wall of the ravine. Not much farther. He lives up on a ledge. We have to climb up to him? Stan said Nero lowered a rope ladder. What's that? Seth asked, pointing up ahead. I'm not sure, Grandma said. A good distance down the ravine, about 20 upright logs of increasing height led from the edge of the stream to the wall of the ravine. The highest log granted access to a rocky ledge. <clears throat> it must be our destination, but this is not what Stan described. They arrived at the logs. The lowest was three feet tall, the next was six feet, and each subsequent log stood roughly three feet taller than the previous one until the tallest rose to about 60 feet high. The logs were arranged about three feet apart in a staggered row. None of the logs had any limbs. Short or tall, they were all of a similar circumference, about 18 inches, and they were all cut flat across. Um, circumference is like a circle, so it's about 18 inches around, which means there's really not that much room for them to land on, but it is flat, so... Someone's going to have to climb this. Placing a hand beside her mouth, Grandma called up to the ledge. Nero, we would like to meet with you. Not a good day, a voice answered, deep and silky. Try me next week. They could not see the speaker. We must meet today or never, Grandma insisted. Who has such an urgent need, the resonant voice inquired. Ruth Sorensen and her grandchildren. Ruth Sorensen? What is your request? We need to find Stan. The caretaker? Yes, I could discern his location. Ascend the stairs and we will discuss terms. Grandma looked around. You don't mean these logs, she said. I most assuredly do. Stan said you had a ladder. That was before I set up these logs. No small undertaking. Climbing, climbing them looks precarious. Call it a filter, Nero said. A means to ensure that those who seek my services are in earnest. So we must climb the logs for the privilege of speaking with you? How about we talk from down here? Unacceptable. Your stairs are equally unacceptable, Grandma said firmly. If your need is dire, you will scale them, observed the troll. What have you done with the ladder? I still have it. May we please climb it instead? I am not dressed for an obstacle course. We'll make it worth your while. How about a compromise? One of you climb the logs, then I will lower the ladder for the other two. That's my final offer. Concede or go acquire your information elsewhere. I'll do it, Seth said. 
Grandma looked at him. If anyone is climbing those logs, it will be me. I'm taller and better able to reach from log to log. I have smaller feet, so the logs will feel bigger. I'll keep my balance easier. Sorry, Seth. This is something I must do. Seth dashed over to the first log, scrambled onto it without much trouble, and taking a jump as if he were playing leapfrog, ended up seated atop the second log. Grandma hurried over to the second log. You get down from there. Seth shakily got to his feet. Leaning forward, he placed his hands on the third log. From this position on the second log, the top of the third log came to almost the middle of his chest. Another leapfrog jump, and he sat atop the nine-foot log. I can do this, he said. It won't be so easy as you get higher, Grandma warned. You come down and let me do it. Kendra watched silent- er, no way, I have- I already have one dead, Grandma. Kendra watched silently. From his seated position, Seth shifted to his knees and rose unsteadily to his feet. He leapt to the next log, now well out of Grandma's reach. Kendra was quietly glad that Seth was climbing the logs. She could not picture Grandma doing it successfully, especially dressed in a bathrobe and slippers. At the very least, thinking the ter of the terrible places that she could get splinters. And Kendra could very easily, clearly envision Grandma Sorensen crumpled in a lifeless heap at the base of a log. Seth, Andrew Sorensen, you mind your grandmother. I want you to come down from there. Stop distracting me, he said. It may seem like fun on these lower logs, but when you get higher... I climb high stuff all the time, Seth insisted. My friends and I climb up the bars under the bleachers at the high school. If we fell there, we could die too. He rose to his feet. He seemed to be getting better at it. Seth landed on the next log, straddling it for a moment before getting to his knees. Be careful, Grandma said. Don't think about the height. I know you're trying to help, said Seth, but please stop talking. Grandma could. Grandma came <clears throat> and stood by Kendra. Can he do this? She whispered. He has a good chance. He's really brave and pretty athletic. He, the height might not get to him. I would freak out. Kendra wanted to look away. She did not want to see him fall, but she could not take her eyes off of her brother as he leapfrogged from log to log, higher and higher. As he jumped to the 13th, almost 40 feet high now, he leaned precariously to one side. Chills raced through Kendra as if she were the one losing her balance. Seth gripped with his legs and leaned over the other way, regaining his equilibrium. Kendra could breathe again. 14, 15, 16. Kendra glanced at Grandma. He was going to make it. 17. He got to his feet, wobbling a little, hands out to either side. These tall ones shake a little, he called down. Seth leapfrogged to the next log and landed awkwardly, teetering too far to one side. For a moment, he hovered on the brink of regaining his balance. Every muscle in Kendra's body clenched in horror. Arms pinwheeling, Seth fell. Kendra shrieked, but she could not look away. Something flashed from the ledge, a slender black chain with a metal weight at the end. The chain coiled around one of Seth's legs. Instead of falling to the ground, he swung onto, into the cliff, colliding roughly with the stone wall. For the first time, Kendra had a view of Nero. But uh, built like a man, the troll had reptilian features. A few bright yellow markings decorated his glossy black body. He held his we in his webbed hand the chain from which Seth now dangled. Muscles bunching powerfully, Seth Nero hauled Seth up to the ledge. They passed out of sight, and then a rope ladder unfurled from the ledge, unwinding all the way to the base of the cliff. Are you okay? Kendra yelled up at Seth. I'm fine, he answered. Just the wind knocked out of me. Grandma started up the ladder, and Kendra followed, forcing herself to focus on grabbing the next rung, denying the impulse to look down. At length, she reached the ledge. She moved to the rear of the ledge, standing beside the low mouth of a dark cave from which wafted a cool draft. Uh, wafted a cool draft. Nero looked even more intimidating up close. Tiny, sleek scales covered his sinuous body. Though he was not much taller than Grandma, the thickness of his brawny physique made him seem massive. He had a snout rather than a nose and bulging eyes that never blinked. A row of sharp spines ran from the center of his forehead to the small of his back. Thank you for rescuing Seth, Grandma said. I told myself that if the boy makes it past 15 logs, I will assist him if he falls. <clears throat> I admit that I am curious to hear what you would exchange to learn for the location of your husband. His voice was suave and rich. Tell us what you have in mind, Grandma said. A long gray tongue popped out of his mouth and licked his right eye. You would have me speak first? So be it. I do not ask much, an insignificant trifle for the proper proprieties um, of this illustrious preserve. Six coffers of gold, twelve puncheons of silver, three casks of uncut gems, and a bucket of opals. Kendra looked at Grandma. Could she possibly own such treasure? A reasonable sum, Grandma said. Unfortunately, we have brought no such riches with us. I can wait while you retrieve the payment, if you leave the girl as collateral. Regrettably, we lack the time to shuttle treasure to you, unless you would reveal Stan's location before receiving compensation. 
Nero licked his left eye and grinned, a hideous sight that displayed double rows of needle teeth. I must be paid in full before fulfilling your request. Grandma folded her arms. I take it you already possess great caches of treasure. It surprises me that such a meager financial offering as I could supply would entice you to trade. Go on, he said. You are offering us a service. Perhaps we could repay you with a service as well. Nero nodded thoughtfully. Possible. The boy has some spirit. Indenture him to me for 50 years. Indenture means um, slavery, so be his slave for 50 years. Seth looked desperately at Grandma. Grandma frowned. I hope to leave the possibility of future business open, therefore I do not wish to leave you feeling slighted. The boy has spirit, but little ability. You would assume the burden of training him as a servant and find yourself yoked by to his incompetence. You would add more value to his life through education than he would through yours, uh, to yours through service. Your candor is appreciated, Nero said, although you have much to learn about bargaining. I begin to wonder whether you could have anything of value to offer. If not, your discussion will not end well. You speak of value, Grandma said. I ask, what value is treasure to a wealthy troll? The more riches he possesses, the less each new acquisition improves his total worth. A bar of gold means much more to a pauper than to a king. I also question what value a frail human servant would have to uh, a master infinitely more wise and capable. Consider the situation. We want you to render a service of value to us, something we cannot do for ourselves. You should expect no less. I agree. Take care. Your words are spreading a net at your feet. A lethal edge was creeping into his voice. True, unless I am trained to deliver a service of extraordinary value. Have you ever received a massage? Are you serious? The idea has always struck me as ridiculous, uh, Nero said. The idea seems absurd to all the... Ooh, the I, uh, the idea seems absurd to all the uninitiated. Beware of rash judgments. We all pursue wealth, and those who gather the most can afford certain comforts unavailable to the masses. Foremost among these luxuries is the indescribable release and relaxation of a massage at the hands of one skilled in the art. And you claim to be skilled in this so-called art? Trained by a true master, my ability is so great as to be, as to be nearly beyond purchase. The only person in the world who has ever received a massage at my hands is the caretaker himself, and this because I am his woman. I could give you a full massage, kneading and soothing every muscle in your body. The experience would redefine your understanding of pleasure. Nero shook his head. It will take more than florid words and grandiose promises to persuade me. Consider my offer in perspective, Grandma said. People pay exorbitant sums for an expert massage. You will receive yours at no cost, merely in exchange for a service. How long would it take you to ascertain uh, Stan's location? A few moments. A massage will take me 30 grueling minutes, and you will be experiencing something new, a delight you have never encountered in your long years. A similar opportunity may never arise again. Nero licked an eye. Granted, I have never received a massage. I could name many things but that I have never done, mainly because I have no interest in doing them. I have sampled human food and found it wanting. I am not convinced that I will find a massage as satisfying as you describe. Grandma studied him. Three minutes. I will give you a sample for three minutes. It will afford you only a narrow glimpse of the unspeakable bliss that awaits, but should place you in a position to make a more educated decision. Very well. I see no harm in a demonstration. Give me your hand. My hand? Yes, I will massage a single hand. You will have to use your imagination to envision how it would feel across your entire body. He held out a hand. Grandma Sorensen took it and began working his palm with her thumbs. At first, he tried to keep a straight face, but his mouth began to twitch and his eyes began to roll. How is that? asked Grandma. Too deep? <clears throat> his meager lips qu quivered. Just right, he purred. Grandma continued expertly rubbing his palm in the back of his hand. He started licking his eye compulsively. She finished with his fingers. The demonstration is concluded, she announced. Thirty minutes of that, you say, across my whole body? The children will assist me, Grandma said. We will trade a service for a service. But I could exchange my service for something more enduring. For treasure, a single massage is too fleeting. The law of diminishing return applies to massages as it does to most things. The first is the best and all you really need. Besides, you can always exchange your services for treasure. This may be your only chance to receive an expert massage. He held out his other hand. One more example, to help me decide. No more samples. You offer just one massage. What if you stay as my personal masseuse for 12 years? Grandma grew stern. I'm not petitioning you to look in that stone of yours multiple times for multiple purposes. I am requesting a single piece of information, a service for a service. That is my offer, lopsided in your favor. 
The massage takes 30 minutes versus mere moments for you to peer into your stone. But you need the information, Nero reminded her. I do not need a massage. Satisfying needs is the burden of the poor. The wealthy and powerful can afford to indulge their wants and whims. If you pass on this opportunity, you will always wonder what you missed. Don't do it, Grandma, Kendra said. Just give him the treasure. Nero held up a finger. This proposition is unorthodox and against my better judgment, but the idea of a massage intrigues me and I'm rarely intrigued. However, 30 minutes is too short. Say, two hours. 60 minutes, Grandma said flatly. 90, Nero countered. Grandma wrung her hands. She folded and unfolded her arms. She rubbed her brow. 90 minutes is too long, Kendra said. You've never given Grandpa a massage longer than an hour. Hold your tongue, child. Hold your tongue, child, Grandma snapped. 90 or no deal, Nero said. Grandma sighed in resignation. All right, 90 minutes. Very well, I accept, but if you, I do not approve of the entire massage, the deal is off. Grandma shook her head. No caveats. A single 90-minute massage in exchange for the location of Stan Sorensen. You will treasure my mem the memory until the end of your days. Nero eyed Kendra and Seth before fixing Grandma with a shrewd gaze. Agreed. How do we proceed? Best table Grandma could find was in fairly narrow stone shelf near the mouth of the cage. cave. Nero stretched out on the shelf and Grandma showed Kendra and Seth how to massage his legs and feet. She demonstrated how and where to use their knuckles and the heels of their hands. He's very strong, she said, grinding her knuckles against the bottom of his feet. Lean into it as much as you want. She set down his leg and stood beside his head. The children have their instruction, Nero. instructions, Nero. The 90 minutes starts now. Kendra hesitantly laid her hands on the troll's bulging calf. Although they were not wet, the scales felt slimy. She, held, she had held a snake before, and the texture of Nero's scales, scaly skin was quite similar. With Nero lying prone, Grandma went to work on the back of his neck and shoulders. She employed a variety of techniques, probing with her thumbs, rubbing with her palms, pressing with her fists, digging with her elbows. She ended up kneeling on the small of his back, careful to avoid the spikes along his spine, squeezing and kneading and applying pressure in diverse ways. Nero was obviously in ecstasy. He purred and moaned in decadent satisfaction. A constant stream of drowsy compliments flowed from his lips. He languidly encouraged them to rub harder and deeper. Kendra grew weary and Grandma periodically demonstrated other techniques for her and Seth to employ. Kendra despised working on Nero's feet the most, from the roughness of his cracked heels to the smooth pads of his calluses to the lumpy bunions on his toes, but she tried her best to follow Grandma's tireless examples. Besides assisting with his feet, feet, legs and feet, Grandma labored on his head, neck, shoulders, back, arms, hands, chest, and abdomen. When they finally finished, Nero sat up with a euphoric smile. All the cunning had vanished from his bulbous eyes. He looked ready for the most satisfying nap of his life. Close to a hundred minutes, Grandma said, but I wanted to do it right. Thank you, he said giddily. I've never imagined something like that. He got to his feet, leaning against the wall of the cliff to steady himself. You have amply earned your reward. I never felt anyone so full of knots and tension, Grandma said. I feel loose now, he said, swinging his arms. I'll be right back with the information you seek. Nero ducked into the cave. I want to see his magic stone, Seth mumbled. Wait patiently, Grandma chided, wiping perspiration from her bow brow. You must be exhausted, Kendra said. I'm not in very good condition, Grandma admitted. That took a lot out of me. She lowered her voice, but it sure beats barrels of treasure that we don't have. Seth wandered over to the brink of the ledge and stared down at the ravine. Grandma took a seat off on the shelf where they had administered the massage, and Kendra waited beside her. Before long, Nero emerged. He still looked affable and relaxed, though not quite as loopy as before. Stan is chained in the basement of the Forgotten Chapel. Grandma's jaw tightened. You're sure? It was a little tricky finding him and see sneaking a good look, considering who else is confined there, but yes, I am certain. He's well? He's alive. Lena was with him? The Naiad? Sure, I saw her too. Was Muriel in the vicinity? Muriel? Why would she- Oh, that's what that was. Ruth, the agreement was for a single piece of information, but no, I didn't catch sight of her. I believe this concludes our arrangement. He gestured towards the ladder. If you'll excuse me, I need to lie down. Okay, that is that chapter. Next one is called The Far Side of the Attic. Remember, Kendra figured out that, like, on the house over here, there's a room that they haven't been able to get into, but they're staying in this part of the attic, so we'll learn about the far side of the attic on the next one. Um, we have a few questions, and then other than that, that will be it. So, chapter 14, questions. Number one, why did Seth say that he could climb up the logs to Nero's cave instead of Grandma? Number two, describe Seth's trip up the logs. So how was he doing it? What happened? 
Number three, what service did Ruth and the kids perform in order to exchange? Wow. What service did Ruth and the kids perform in exchange for information? How long was that service? What did Nero's skin feel like? Where are Grandpa and Lena imprisoned at? Next one. Seth disobeyed his, disobeyed his grandma and started to climb the logs when she said that she should do it. Do you think that Seth made the right choice in doing that? Why or why not? Number eight, in your own words, describe the negotiation process that went on between grandma and Nero. So they had that back and forth and figured out a compromise to get the information in exchange for a service. How did that go? And number nine, in three to five sentences, predict how you think that this book is going to end. So we're getting kind of close to the end. So what do you think is going to happen from here on out? Alrighty, that is all for the day. Hope you have a good one. Bye.